he first heard that the Jews were going to attempt to rebuild the walls, he laughed. He ridiculed them. But now his laughter has turned to anger. Now he's mad. Sanballat, as governor of Samaria, controlled the tax base. Okay? He got revenue. He was in charge of the money. And he was levying taxes not only on Samaria, but he was also levying taxes on the northern region of Judea, which included Jerusalem. So when they began to come, and, and, and King Artaxerxes gave them permission to come and rebuild these walls and fortify the city, that was a threat to him particularly to his bank account. So his money source was drying up. Now there's competition. There's a new kid on the block, Nehemiah, friends of the king. So if the Jews were rebuilding Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah, some of the power and revenue he obtained from that land was going to slip from his hands. And Sanballat didn't like that. Then you have Tobiah, the Ammonite. He's also mentioned in chapter 2. And he's a longtime enemy of the Jewish nation. Way back from the days when Moses was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. You remember the story? They went through the wilderness time. As they began to approach the land of Israel, they asked and they came to a resistance from the Ammonites. The Ammonites would not give them passage into the land of Israel. Later on in history, the Ammonites hired a false prophet by the name of Balaam to trick the children of Israel so God would curse them. But God intervened with Balaam the prophet instead of cursing uh, Israel, he actually blessed Israel and he encountered an angel in the road that he couldn't see but his donkey saw it and his donkey talked to him. How many remember the story of the donkey talking in the Bible? That was Balaam. He was the guy hired by the Ammonites, the people that hated Israel. This is where Tobiah was from. So these enemies are identified for any battle you have to know who you're fighting. Right? Part of military intelligence is to know who is the group that fosters the attack. What are they like? How do they operate? If you don't know how your enemy operates, you won't know how to defend yourself and you won't know how to defeat them, right? You can't fight someone successfully unless you know your enemy. You have to know that. A few years ago, a Gallup survey in the United States reported that 70% of Americans believe in the devil. I would say 70% are right, 30% are wrong, because whether you believe it or not doesn't change the reality that the devil exists. But of the 70% that believe in the devil, only half of them believe he's a literal being. The other half believes he's an evil force, an evil nature in man, or a symbol of evil. I love this quote. In fact, it's one of my favorite quotes from Dwight L. Moody. He said this. He said, I believe in the devil for two reasons. Number one, because the Bible says he's real. And number two, because I've done business with him. Amen. How many, know, how many have had the devil interfere in your business before? Amen. Jesus knew he was real. Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. More than anything the devil wants is to disguise himself from us. He wants to make you believe that your enemy is someone else other than him. He wants to make you believe your enemy is somebody you work with. He wants you to make you believe that your enemy is somebody that you're married to. He disguises himself. Do you hear what I'm saying? Come on, that was revelation for some of you today. You thought you were married to the devil, you're not. Amen? Yeah, amen. God bless you. <laughs> Satan will often disguise himself like unlikely characters in our life. And he'll cause us to turn our attack toward people that aren't the problem. He'll disguise himself behind people we love. You remember when Jesus was talking to Peter and Peter recognized who Jesus was? He said, you're Messiah. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then a few verses down, Jesus begins to take off the veil of his purpose. 
and talk about being led to Jerusalem and, and being killed. And, and he's for the very first time really exposing to his disciples his real purpose for being on the earth. And it, it, and it really shocks Peter. And Peter says, far be it from you, Lord. Don't let that happen to you. I'm not going to let you die. And what did Jesus, he looked at Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of things of the spirit. You're mindful of things of the flesh. Now, Peter wasn't even saying anything bad. He was saying, Jesus, I love you. I don't want you to die. I don't want you to be crucified. But let me tell you, even something that sounds good, if it distracts you from your purpose, is not good. And the enemy will come forth to try to distract you with good things, not just bad things. Peter's like, I love you, Jesus. And, and I don't want to see you die, Jesus. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You know, well, that's a harsh response, Jesus. He's just trying to show you that he loves you. Listen, what you have to understand is you cannot tolerate or allow anything to get in the way of the vision that God has set before you. Amen? The vision of his house. That's why I'm preaching these messages to you. Because I want your house and I want this house to move forward in the purposes that God has called us to move forward. I feel a sense of urgency. I feel like time is short. I feel like people's lives are at stake. And we have the antidote to the toxin in this generation. And I believe that God is going to help us to build in a way that will rescue people and give them the antidote for the thing that is trapping their lives away from their purpose. I really believe that. When you decide that you're going to get serious with God, he becomes not just your savior, but your Lord. That means his will becomes paramount in every decision and you place his kingdom before everything else. When you do that, all of hell and all of hell's minions will align themselves against you. I promise you that. So Sanballat and his buddies with their armies all came out against Nehemiah and they begin to lob these taunts, these jibes, these insults and sarcastic questions to crush the spirits of the builders, of the workers who are rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. We face similar things every single day. In fact, did you know that the word devil actually means in its literal translation slanderer? The word devil means slander, and it's a, good it's a good title for him. Amen? He's the devil. He's the slanderer in chief. Amen? The Bible says in Revelation 12, he's the accuser of the brethren who accuses them before God day and night. Can you imagine? When you start following God and the purposes of God, the devil will begin to look through every detail of your life, everything in your place, and he'll begin to accuse you before God, trying to bring assaults against you, trying to discourage you. He'll not only do that, he'll accuse you before other people too. You have to decide, am I going to shrink back into all of my failures and all of my mess and all of my problems, or am I going to keep pressing forward in spite of them being who God has called me to be? I encourage you to do that. Amen. You have to face your fight. You have to face it. So all of the onslaught is coming against Nehemiah. Look how he responds. Verse four, he immediately looks up and he says, hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Don't cover their iniquity. Don't let their sin be blotted out for they have provoked you to anger before the builders mm. say before the builders you're a builder I'm a builder amen but God's God and he's the author of the vision the first thing that happens when the onslaught comes against Nehemiah is Nehemiah without hesitation responds by prayer to God the problem is that often our first response isn't to pray. Our first response is to retaliate. 
Oh yeah, it happens. You let somebody start accusing you. You let somebody start questioning your character. You let somebody start coming against you. I promise you, your first, now some of you might be more spiritual than me, but some of, my first response is to defend myself, right? To get defensive, to, to, to attack. And I know, I see some of your Facebook posts. I know you're the same too, right? Somebody comes against what you're doing or doing. Well, I'm going to retaliate against that, right? I'm going to say that. I'm going to defend this. I'm going to defend that, right? Yeah, your pastor has Facebook too. Amen. I retaliate sometimes too. Amen. Have you know we need a lot of grace. That's why we're learning from Nehemiah today. Hallelujah. We're learning from Nehemiah. So look how his prayer, he begins, Hear, O our God, and he ends, For they have provoked you to anger. And I love what he didn't say. He didn't say, God, I'm mad. God, uh, they've provoked us to anger. Because Nehemiah knew something powerful, he knew it wasn't about him. This isn't about him. Nehemiah is just a servant of him. It's about God. And he knew it was about God. And this was God's vision. And this was God's assignment. And it was God's provision. And it was God's promise. And Nehemiah had to face this fight knowing that it was God's fight. When your battle becomes his battle, amazing things can happen. When your battle isn't your battle anymore, when you take your hands loose and let go of it, amazing things can happen. If you want to fight your own battle, God will let you. And at the end of it, he'll say, how did that work out for you? God's a lot stronger than you are. Amen? He's a lot stronger than you. And here's a powerful principle. Whenever someone comes against God's plans or direction, God takes it personally. God takes it personally. God will step in in some way at some point and get involved. And by the way, God does a better job than you do. He'll do a better job than you will. His vengeance is more potent than your vengeance. That's why in Romans 12 he said, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Something interesting I noticed while reading this passage, Nehemiah is being attacked by his enemies. He's identified them. He stops and he prays to God, but not one time do you see him turning to his enemies and saying anything to them. This really stood out to me. He doesn't talk to his enemies, but he talks to God concerning his enemies. It's time to stop looking around and talking and yelling at your enemies all the time. All those things, all those people that are coming against you, right? All your circumstances, all the things that, that want to come and oppress you. Quit paying attention to them. Turn your face to God. Right? First of all, your real enemy is the devil. Secondly, he's already been defeated at the cross of Christ. Hallelujah. Amen? Verse 6. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. This is a powerful verse. We, we actually preached out of this verse last week. The people prayed, but here's what I want you to see. They prayed, and they kept working. They didn't pray and wait. They prayed and worked. God hasn't called you to be suffocated by the enemy. He hasn't called you to curl up in your bed sheets and wait for something to happen. He hasn't called you to live in the holes of discouragement and despair. You're not like the world. You have the God that has called you to live above. Live above the enemy. Live above the accusations. Live above the mockery. Live above. Turn to somebody next to you and look at them right in the eyes and say, live above. Live above. Right? There's this idea about prayer that once you turn something over to God, you just have no responsibility anymore. Right? There's this, it, 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 and, and it's, it is a truth that the battle is the Lord's. It is truth that all strength is his. It is not true that my responsibility is just non-existent. Right? This becomes a welcome message to procrastinators who say, well, if the Lord meant for me to have it, 
I would have it. If the Lord wanted me to go, I would go. If the Lord did this, right? And we have the propensity to relieve ourselves from the human element of responsibility of engagement. We are still responsible to engage under the spiritual principle that faith without action is dead. Faith, if you really believe something, you're going to act like you believe it anyway. If you really believe in something, you're going to do it. You're going to put all your energy into it. You're going to focus on it, right? And so when you pray and release something to God, if you have faith that this is his battle, it is his vision, then you pray and you keep working. You keep building. You've got to build in the battle. There was a judge who was running for re-election in his town. The opposition was making slanderous remarks against him during his campaign. His campaign manager came to him and said, Judge, you need to answer these accusations. What are you going to tell the public about all these things they're saying against you? The judge looked over at him and smiled. He said, you know, when I was a boy, we had an old dog out on the farm. And when there would come a full moon, that dog would start barking and barking and barking at the moon. But you know what? That moon just kept shining. He said, here's what we're going to do. Let that old dog bark and I'm just going to keep shining. There's a lot of revelation in that little story right there. Come on, say, let the dog bark. I'm going to keep shining. Amen. So Nehemiah and the people bring the issue to God and they persist in their work and keep building. God's saying that to you today. Somebody here has been discouraged and you've started to hold back in some areas. God's saying, pick it up, pick up the weapons, push forward, take another step, don't quit. Verse 7. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites, it actually literally means that there were people on every side, the north, the south, the east, and the West, when they heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, they're starting to see the success, that they became very angry. First of all, they were laughing and joking and mocking. Then they became angry. Now they're very angry. And all of them conspired together. All of them. The Ammonites... The Ashdodites, the people of Sambalat, the Horonites, the, the, the ones from Samaria, and the Arabians all came together to conspire to stop this work of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. They all came together to conspire and attack Jerusalem, and it says this, and create confusion. How many know if you let confusion enter your life, if you let confusion get in your house, if you let confusion get in your work, if you let confusion enter at any point, it will stop progress. So guess what the devil wants to do? He wants to bring confusion. So at first in the building process, you see opposition by mockery. You see intimidation and fear and discouragement. But now you have a whole new level, opposition by conspiracy. The enemy will always try to intimidate you and mock you and control you with fear. But if he can't get you with fear, he will change his tactics and he will hit you where you can't see. That's what this verse actually means. When the Bible says they conspired together to come and attack and create confusion, what it was saying in its original language is let's go in among them and be covert and attack them from within. Actually, literally one translator of the Bible named Cyril Barber, who's a, who's a powerful biblical translator, says that in this text, it could be translated like this. They conspired together to come into me. In other words, to come and attack me, Nehemiah, and create confusion. What their goal was, was to come and undermine the leadership. We can't get them from without. We can't make them afraid. We can't intimidate them. So let's infiltrate them. Them and let's turn them against their leader. Let's create confusion in them against their leader. That's what they were wanting to do. 
right? Let's, let's get among them. Let's evoke slander. Let's create divided loyalties against Nehemiah. In any organization or group of people, there will be shrewd men or women who will take advantage of people that are disgruntled and offended. In any situation where people are working or building, church included and foremost, there will be people that are disgruntled and get offended. We call it being hurt. It's a $5 word for being mad, right? because of what somebody said or did to me or something happened with me and it makes me want to separate out. This is exactly what this verse is describing. And so what you have is you have people that have selfish motives that will find the offended people and the disgruntled people and manipulate the situation to their advantage. They say, hey, can you just pray about something with me? Oh, yeah, what do you want me to pray about with you? And the interesting thing is those conversations start with pray, but pray never happens. Instead, it becomes gossip and slander that begins to stir up hearts against this and that. We begin to look at everything horizontally. We lose sight of the vision. We're not asking God what he thinks about it anymore. You have to be careful because it happens. Oh, it's, it's happened here before. It has. It, it, it's been a part uh, uh, of the reality of this place because anybody that's building, the devil is going to try to stop the work from moving forward. He's going to try to get you to take your hands off the work. He's going to try to get you angry with somebody, hurt with somebody, offended at somebody, so that you will get distracted from the main vision. A similar thing happened when Absalom came against his father David, trying to overthrow David's kingdom. He took advantage of people's offenses, the Bible says, that he stole the hearts of the people. And he created a rebellion against his own father it happened and, and, and it's always a plan of the enemy to dismantle you to discredit you and to destroy you with confusion because guess who the author of confusion is satan is the author of confusion so Nehemiah is dealing with this opposition. His opposition isn't just the Ashdodites and the Ammonites and the Arabians and Sanballat. His opposition is with the devil. Because the devil is inspiring them to come and bring confusion against the work of God. So Nehemiah is dealing with these, this opposition. He's got the Ashdodites on the west side. He's got the Ammonites on the east side. The Samaritans are in the north and the Arabians are in the south. And all Nehemiah wants to do is God's will. All he wants to do is inspire his people and encourage them and help them build the wall. So he prays and he persists. And they come at him again. And when that doesn't work, they come at him a different way. This time to dismantle his leadership and create confusion. Look at Nehemiah's response. This is powerful. Verse 9. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to God. I love that word, nevertheless. Sometimes that needs to be our word to the enemy. All things are coming against us. I don't know how to handle this situation. I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills tomorrow. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. We make our prayer to God, and because of them, we will set a watch day and night. Now, Nehemiah and his people took things up a notch. The first time, they prayed and they persisted. They prayed and they continued working, but this time, they prayed and they set a watch. They prayed and protected, right? We have to guard our hearts. We have to guard our families, and we have to guard the house of God. Two things I want you to see, and both of these are important if you want to overcome discouragement. The people had a mind to work, and the people had a heart to pray. The people had a mind to work, and they had a heart to pray. I'm calling us to prayer like never before this year, because when we have a heart to pray, God will give us a mind to work. When we have a heart to pray, God will focus our vision on the place he's calling us to go to. They set a watch. They had a heart to pray. They had a mind to work. And they had an eye to watch. Amen. So they had their faith going this way. They had their mind focused on the vision. And they had their eyes set against the enemy. That's a powerful place to be. Verse 10. Then Judah said... 
the strength of the laborers is failing. And there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. The devil is okay with you getting halfway as long as you don't get all the way. They got halfway and then they begin to get discouraged and they begin to hear all of these things and some people begin to get disgruntled and some people were worried because this person's working harder and this person's not working hard enough. And they, all these things, and they begin to get discouraged in their heart until they, they begin to look and all they saw was trash. They didn't see the vision anymore. They just saw the rubbish. What do you do with trash? You throw it away. You take it out or you sell it on Craigslist. But either way, you get rid of it, amen? Because you can't build a wall with trash. You have to build a wall with stones, right? Every individual has trash in their building process that needs to be taken out. Just rubbish, the stuff that gets in the way. The stuff that keeps us from getting to our materials. In the days of Nehemiah in the city of Jerusalem, they had a special gate for trash. A couple of messages ago, I showed you the map. And, it showed, and we showed that gate down on the south end of the city. You know what it was called? It was called the dung gate. The dung gate. Or the rubbish gate. Listen, every one of us needs a dung gate in our life. We need an exit place to get the trash out. Right? We need a strategy to remove the debris. Why? Because you have to take the garbage out. You have to get rid of your own personal trash. The bad habits, the doubt, the complaining, the wrong thinking, the bad habits, the attitude. You have to take the trash out. You ever see the show Hoarders? People can't see the floors or walls of their furniture, their house, because they've hoarded so much stuff. A lot of times Christian spiritual lives look like that. Spiritual hoarders, attitudes, issues, habits, they're all invading our space and we can't get to the thing that God has called us to live in, the thing that he's called us to build. We can't see the vision anymore. We have to take the rubbish out. Let's rebuild the dung gate and let's get the trash out of our city, out of our life, right? Things get piled up. They become heavy over time. So you need to constantly reevaluate and realign your mind and your heart with God's purpose. And you need to look at the things and evaluate what's really important and valuable in your life. And there's some things that might be sentimental, but they need to go out the dung gate because they're getting in the way of God's purposes in your life, right? In the great theological words of Frozen, let it go. All right, get rid of it. You have to get it out of the way so you can build, cut it out. Constantly be aware of what God wants for you now. That might have been great 10 years ago, but God has something new for you today. So we have to face our fight. I know I took a lot of time on that first. We're going to hit these next three real quick. But God is doing something and we have to get this. If you don't get anything else but face your fight, that's going to make a huge difference in your whole world this year. The second key is this, find your provision. Find your provision. When we are in the fight to help us get through the fight, we have provision. There's all kinds of provisions that God has given you. He's put in your hand. One provision you're sitting in right now, it's the relationships in the church. Your relationships in your church. That's a provision for you. Provision of relationship. You've got the provision. You've got the provision of the pastor. Amen. We need pastoring in our lives. That's important. Another provision is prayer. That's a key provision. That's your access point to God. That was Nehemiah's first resort. The enemies are coming to attack. Pray. There was no preparation. They didn't stand in a circle and join hands. They didn't bow their heads and close their eyes. They just started crying out to God. They just reacted in prayer. Can you imagine when something happened, your first reaction immediately was like Nehemiah. Before you had time to think about anything, you reacted by turning to God. It was a, it was a reaction. It was a first reaction. Stop and pray. And then figure it out. A lot of times we, we approach the situation as when all else fails, pray, right? Well, the doctors can't do anything else. We just have to pray. Amen. Well, we, you don't have to wait till then. You can start praying before. Amen. You have to pray. You have another provision, a provision of promise. 
You have to find your provisions. God's promises are provisions for you. Look at verse 14. It says, I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. If you underline things in your Bible, underline that that phrase right there. Remember the Lord. Great and awesome. And fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. There's a key phrase in this verse. Remember the Lord. Nehemiah is in Jerusalem because he remembered the promise of the Lord. How do you know? Because he said it back in chapter 1. And you know because of the way that he grew up. There's a phrase, he remembered that God in his word had predicted 70 years of captivity if the Jews disobeyed God, and they did, and God did. And that happened. In fact, he even quotes that, Leviticus 26, when he prays in chapter 1. He remembered the judgments of God and the 70 years of captivity, but he also remembers the promise of God. A promise that started back through Moses that if we repent and turn back to you, you'll bring us back. If we repent and turn back to you, you'll take us back out of captivity. So here is Nehemiah repenting for all of Israel. The people are back. The walls are still not built. And he says, Lord, bring us back to build. And then he went and started building. He didn't just pray for it. He started doing it. He was there on a promise because he remembered the promises of God. Sometimes you need to remember the promises of God in your life because when you hold on to those promises, they're like weapons against the enemy because word, God's word is true. God is not a man that he should lie. His promises will come to pass. Lord, bring us back to build. Nehemiah knew the word. He knew the scriptures. He knew the promises of God. You have to know your Bible. That's another provision, God's word. So you can call to mind the promises of God. Right? If you will take certain promises in the Bible and commit them to memory, it will affect your whole life. Memory verses are not just for children's church. Adult church needs to have memory verses. Amen? Use little sticky pads. Find places to put the promises of God. Commit those things to memory. It's not that hard. Then when you're in a battle, you're going to have a provision. When you're in a battle, you're going to have a weapon against the enemy to speak the promises of God. Amen? Another provision is persistence. That's another one of the provisions that we find. There's something about staying on task. They built the wall. They continued to build the wall. Verse 6, and the entire wall was joined together up to half it tight. The people had a mind to work. You have to have persistence. You have to stick to it. Well, I'm not sure if I remember what God said. But if God said it to you and you knew he said it back then, stick with it. He didn't change his mind. Amen? He didn't change his mind. Look at verse 15. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing. All of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. I'm calling this house to return to the wall. I'm calling to this house to return to the work that God has called you to. Come on, do you have some... uh, If God calls you to something, keep doing it. Until you can't do it anymore. Keep doing it until it's finished. But do you have some enemies in your life? You you want to drive your enemies crazy? First of all, love them. That's going to drive them nuts, right? Secondly, stay on task for the thing you're being criticized about. Keep working. Amen? It'll encourage your relationship with God. It'll drive your enemies crazy. That's exactly what Nehemiah did. So you're, you're, you're pastoring your prayers, your promises, your persistence. These are all provision. You have to find your provision. The third key, the third key, build with balance. I could just say it this way, keep your balance. Face your fight, find your provision, keep your balance. We can all find balance, and it's easy to get off balance. There are people in our lives that in the battle bring the balance. And I want you to see that in this text, and we'll apply it. Look at verse 16. So it was from that time on, half of my servants worked at construction, while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those 
who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other they held a weapon. Right? That's an interesting way to build. But what I want you to see here is the balance. God has called you to keep your balance. And when you're walking through something and standing in faith. You know, I watched a, a, a YouTube video. I don't know, one of these guys that are, that are just nuts that like walk across the Grand Canyon on, or Niagara Falls or something like that on a tightrope. Right, with that thing, and there's like no safety harness. And I'm watching the video. Now, this is already done. It's like something in the past, and I'm still nervous about it. Right? I'm watching the guy on the video balance, you know, and I'm, and I'm feeling tense. And all of a sudden, I realize that's kind of the same feeling I get sometimes when I'm walking in, in, after the things of God. I get that tense feeling. Like, like am I going to fall? Am I going to make it across to the other side? You have to keep your balance. Balance is the key. If you know and you're confident in keeping your balance, you're going to make it. Keeping your balance. The problem is we get overloaded in our lives and all of the things that we do and all of the busyness that we carry. And what we do is we get burned out. And then when we get burned out, we want to throw everything out. And that's not what you do. Because then you go from being off balance this way and you overcompensate and you lose balance this way. You don't throw everything off the plate, just take a couple of things off the plate, right? Get your plate back into a manageable level. Come into balance, and when you're walking in the things of God, whatever you need to do to keep it happening. They had half the, they could have said, okay, our enemies are coming against us, and they panic, and then everybody puts on armor, and everybody has swords, and we're defending against the enemy, but nobody's building the wall. So what's the purpose in defending? We're not building anything, right? Or everybody get back to building the wall. And so now we're all putting stones up. But since nobody's defending, the enemy's coming in through the cracks of the sides and he's destroying what we're building as fast as we're building. So you have to have balance. You have to watch and pray. Amen. You have to build and, and, and you have to, to, to protect. You have to see all of these things working together. Different people doing different tasks at the same spot for the glory of God. Some were builders, some were battlers. Some were just behind them as leaders, as administrators. You need everybody in their place doing their gift. When everybody is in place, when everybody in the house of God is doing what God has called them to do. I have some people here, your calling in God is to bombard heaven behind the scene, doing spiritual warfare, driving back spiritual of darkness in the air. Amen. I have people here that your gifts are very practical and you come in and you take care of this need or that need. Some of you can handle two or three things. Some of you can handle one thing. But if everybody can do what God has assigned you to do, the wall gets built, God moves, and the enemy gets driven back. It's all about keeping your balance. In the same way, the Christian life, our Christian life is always about balance. It's a great picture of the body of Christ. You never are called to do this by yourself. You'll never stay in balance on your own. Never try to build alone. Building is always a team project. You are never wired to do it by yourself. Verse 18 says, every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built. And the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. As they built the wall higher, they had to have the trumpet sound so that they would blast, so that the people would know when their shift changes, so that the people would know what they were supposed to do. Because as the wall built up, it was harder to hear and communicate. So that's why they had the trumpet. People in our lives help keep balance in our lives. God gave you two eyes and he put both of them on the same side of your head. You know why? Because he wants to remind you that you can't see everywhere by yourself. You need each other. You need somebody to have your back. That's a spiritual principle. It's in your biology. God created it that way. He created us for team. Not to be lone wolf. Amen. There's never just one gift. There's never just one style of ministry. There's never one person that's to be lifted up as more important, more anointed than somebody else. It's called the body of Christ. Which is more important, your eyes or your ears? It depends. Do you need to hear something or do you need to see something? If I'm playing music or singing, my ears are more important. If I'm driving a car, my eyes are more important. You want all of it working together. I had one person say, well, I feel like I'm the big toe in the body of Christ. Listen, I could live without my big toe, but I want my big toe. Amen. 
I want all my parts just because I can live without it doesn't mean I want to. I need you. We all have our place and position. We all work together to be the body of Christ. Right? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, different gifts, but the same spirit. Different kinds of serving, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God working in them all. That's the body of Christ. And the Bible tells us Jesus is the head of the body. That means he's the brain. That means he's connected to everything else. Your brain and your body is your master organ. 10 billion nerve cells. 10 billion nerve cells able to connect to every part and cell of your body, regulating things. Taking in the senses, what you see, smell, feel, hear, process, all the things around you connect to you. Every movement that you make, all the things I'm doing, I'm talking and moving, all these things at the same time, I'm not thinking about it because I have 10 billion nerve cells in my brain in control of what's going on. Sending signals all over my body to the organs, to the 600 plus muscles, ligaments, bones, and so that there's this smooth, coordinated movement. That's why God calls his church his body. That's how we're supposed to be, so in tune with Him that we flow in perfect unity together with each other. The body of Christ is wonderful when there's that kind of balance of coordination. When we're hearing from the head, the Holy Spirit conveying the power to this part of the body and that part of the body. It's powerful, conveying resources. The fourth key, final key, and we're closing. The fourth and final key, carry confidence be bold carry confidence face your fight find your provision keep your balance and carry your confidence think about it if you're on a winning team and you lose confidence you could lose the game confidence is a huge part of winning you need to have assurance verse 19 Nehemiah said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. So wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Come back to center point. Our God will fight for us. Mm. Now I want you to notice a combination. There's this correlation between verse 14 and verse 20. You can look at it. Verse 14, he's talking about fighting for each other, fighting for your brethren, right? That means you. That means you pick up a weapon. That means you're an intercessor. That means you're engaging in battle. You're fighting for your brothers. You're standing together with other people in the body of Christ that have needs, right? And in verse 20, he says, God will fight for us. So which is it? Are you fighting? Or is God fighting? The answer is yes. You're both fighting because you're working together. Do what God has called you to do and let God do what God can do. Let God do what you can do. You do what God assigns you and God does everything else. Listen, the results are up to him. You cannot lead something into greatness if you don't have confidence. You cannot walk into the full purposes of God with small-mindedness. We cannot build something miraculous like Nehemiah was called to build the walls of Jerusalem with small thinking and small vision. We can't have a phone booth vision. If God has called us to touch a city, if he's called us to touch nations, this congregation right here just within this place right here in our early service are touching nations continuing to go and build we don't have it down yet we don't have everything figured out yet but let me tell you something stones are going on the walls and we're building something and we're going to build something greater this year than we've ever seen I believe it and can I tell you in the process you cannot be controlled by your emotions either your emotions want to control you. We all have them and we all need to use them, but you cannot be controlled by them. You have to be in control of them, right? Your control comes from the Spirit of God. If you let your emotions take over you, you're going to misrepresent God in the process of building. But I believe that when God calls you in the process of the call, listen, you become invincible. 
invincible. I love that word. It makes me think of superheroes. But listen what I'm telling you. You are invincible until God is done. You are invincible until God is finished with you. You are invincible. A child of God doing the work of God in the will of God is invincible until God is done. The only way that you die early in the process is to quit. If you will keep your hands to the plow and your face focused on the vision, God will push you through until it's finished. I believe that. Listen to my language. When, the time, when, when our time is up, who wants to hang around anyway? It's time to go home, go to glory, get graduated, praise God, be in heaven for all eternity. That is awesome. But until then, I'm working, I'm building, I'm praying, I'm protecting, I'm loving, I'm serving, I'm reaching, I'm touching, I'm being a light, I'm doing something in this generation that God has called me before the foundations of the world to do. I'm being a part of a house, I'm leading a house, I'm pushing you forward. You have to be courageous in what he's called you to do. And when you know that you're invincible, I ask this question, what would you do if you knew ahead of time you would not fail? What would you set out to do if you knew before you started, you wouldn't fail doing it. Let me tell you, if you know you have the calling of God, Nehemiah, pack your stuff, leave Persia, go to work, build what I've called you to build. Stand against the enemy in this generation. And be bold and don't stop. I'm telling you, Nehemiah was un. Unstoppable. He was invincible. If the enemy can't get you on the inside, he'll never get you on the outside. You hear what I'm saying to you? When you know that you can set into process with building confidence, don't worry about the circumstances. Don't worry about the thing. Many times God strengthens you. He sets you up by putting you in the middle of trouble just so you can see how great he is. Come on, just close your eyes with me. It's the combination today of your faith and your active work that's the key to victory in the building process. Building strategies, strategic thinking to build while you're in the battle today. Strategic thinking. Some of you here today, I don't know who I'm preaching to. Today, I was saying this in the first service, but let me tell you, there are some people here that you have been so, you've taken some blows, you've had the wind knocked out of you, and discouragement has been like ropes that have tied your hands and feet back. And you could see where you desperately want to go, but you feel powerless to get there. Today, I see the hand of heaven coming and cutting the ropes. Today, I see God saying to you, whatever I've called you to do, I'm calling you to finish. Well, I didn't work over here. We'll reconnect here. We're going to build here. It's okay. Get back in your place. Be who God has called you to be. Don't set back. It's time to reach. It's time to serve. It's time to give. It's time to go. It's time to do something. God has got you in such a focus point of his life and your destiny. And discouragement and depression and defeat has been holding you back. Today, I believe there's deliverance for you in this meeting. I believe there's deliverance for you in this word that I've just preached for you. It's time every, with every one of these messages, it's like there's key points that are stripping the things off of us that are keeping us from being who God has called us to be. Today, God is calling you. Men and women, young people, God is calling. You're not too young. You're not too young to build the wall. You're not too young to obey God. You're not too young to make a difference. Come on, whatever place you're at in life. Well, well, I have my family and I have work and I'm trying to balance. That's okay. God's going to show you what you can do. and You put your energy there. Well, I feel like I passed my moment and I should have done this 20 years ago. If you're still alive and breathing, it's not too late for you. Get up. You can pick up a stone. You can build the wall. Today, God is going to break discouragement off of your life. I'm going to ask everybody to stand to your feet with me. Right now, if you are in this room, 
This is, this is, I'm just being real with you today, as real as I know how to be. Listen, if you're in this room and you've been battling discouragement or defeat, and there's been things that have been tying you back from the thing that's in your heart, the thing that God has pulled you to do, you may not know how it's going to happen, but for some reason you feel like you've stopped taking some steps. Today, God wants to break that off of you. If that's you right now, I want you to slip out of where you're at and I want you to come down to the front and we're going to pray for you right now. Come on, I know it, sometimes it's not easy to answer because the same discouragement that has been holding you back keeps you from coming. But I'm telling you, there is deliverance in this word for you today. There's deliverance in this word for you today. What is stopping you from getting to the place where God is calling you to be? It may not even be something bad. It just might be a distraction. It might be something that, that when you heard this word today, I got stirred up to my vision. But when I believe there's two or three people in this room, you need to respond. Because when you respond, there is a breaking, come up, there's a breaking in the spirit over your life. When you respond, you open the door for God to move. It's not about there's nothing special at the front versus at your seat. God can touch you anywhere. But it's the, it's the act of responding that says before God and everybody, God, I'm coming to you. Just like Nehemiah looked up and lifted his head to you. When Sanballat and Tobiah, when the Arabians were coming, the Ammonites, the Astrodites, when they were coming against him from every side. And he looked up and he said, God, you deal with them. I'm going to keep building the wall. Today, God says, if you will let me deal with the stuff, I will let you keep building the legacy and the destiny that I put on you. Are you ready? Come on church, just extend your hands forward right now and begin to pray. If you still need to come down, it's not too late for you. There's somebody that's hesitating. You need to come because there's deliverance for you out of this, out of this bondage that the enemy has put on your mind, on your life, on your experience, in your family. In the name of Jesus, I call for the purposes of God to be released. I call for the purposes of God to be released. I call on your destiny. I call on your legacy today. I call on it in Jesus' name. I break discouragement. I break it in Jesus' name. I break every feeling like it's too late. I can't do it. I'm disqualified. I break it in Jesus' name. Come on. Come on, Jesus, right now, right now, everything, break, break, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, right now, I call for hope to rise in you. Come on, it's not hopeless, it's hopeful. You can't deny who you are. You can't deny who you are. Come on, God's with you in transition time. God's with you in transition time. Come on, in the name of Jesus. Come on, right now, in the name of Jesus. Right now, Lord, I thank you, God. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. I call on the word of the Lord. I call on the word of God. I call on it. I call on it. Oh, kadabo shata. I call on it. I call on it in you right now. Come on, it's not too late. You look to him. Come on, there's stones that you can pick up. There's places of building that God has called you to. Don't be afraid. It gets scary. You feel like I'm going to get hit again. You're not. Come on, stand up in the name of Jesus. Discouragement. Break. Discouragement. Come off in Jesus' name. I call for the purposes of God to be released right now. It doesn't matter what has been. It matters what's coming. It doesn't matter what has been. It matters what's coming. It doesn't matter what has been. It matters what's coming. Come on, get a hold of who you are today. Stand up, dust yourself up, be who you are. I call on the gifts of God in you. I call on the purpose, the legacy of God. I will not be moved. Come on, church, raise your hand, sing it. I'm anchored. I'm not shaken today. Jesus. Come on, I call on your heart, your vision. 
the character is sick. You don't have a growing home The devil fights you so hard. Don't you back down. Don't you quit. In the name of Jesus, I call on it. I call on your legacy. Don't you quit. Don't you stop. In the name of Jesus, don't stop. He who began a good work in you, the Word says, is faithful to complete it. He's faithful to complete it in the name of Jesus. He's faithful to complete it. Come on, He's faithful to complete it. He is, it's His battle. The Lord will fight for you. Come on, the Lord will fight for you. The Lord will fight for you in the name of Jesus. I call on it in Jesus' name. The purposes of God. I will not be is in you God my hope is in you my strength is the God who called you he's going to fulfill you in the name of Jesus do you believe that today is there somebody in the house who's ready to build the wall is there somebody in the house who's ready to build you're called you're appointed Come on, it's in your destiny. It's in your identity today. Amen. We're going to keep praying. If you need to come down, if there's something you want specific prayer for, if you have sickness in your body, if you have a need, we want to minister to that as well. Come on, God is in this place. And where His presence in, we can draw, where His presence is, we can draw whatever we need. Amen. You can get a hold of that today. Don't miss this moment. But we won't have a formal dismissal. Tomorrow is a uh, is holiday of President's Day. Our church offices and school will be closed. But tomorrow night prayer will still be open. Amen. We're still going to be praying and JCI, our Bible college classes, are still in tomorrow night.